Hi from New York, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. I'm Peter Dixon Moses, and this talk is titled Query Logs, Click Logs, and Insights. Here I am in a tree. I clambered into the search business a little over 10 years ago, and I've been exploring the different branches ever since. My work today could loosely be described as search relevance in the service of funnel optimization optimization, but this isn't a search relevance talk. It's also not a machine learning talk. It's a data and product talk. Much of what I'm going to cover can be improved with machine learning, NLP in particular, but the purpose of what I'm about to share with you is simply to get acquainted with a really useful data collection, which grows as your business grows. So, where do most search teams spend their time? Well, on findability and ranking for searchable business data, of course. It's the product, the showcase, the reason your customers are there, the reason why you have a job. Uh, it's the most important data set. It needs domain experts. It's the best metadata. It's the SORI, sophisticated ranking techniques, real-time updates, and badges. Lots and lots of badges. But what about Retail 101? Hi, what can I help you find today? Let me show you what we have available. Did you find what you were looking for today? It's not an easy experience to replicate in a digital environment. Chatbots can be super annoying. And post checkout surveys. I mean, when's the last time you filled out a post checkout survey? But step this way into the world of search where customers just can't stop sharing what they're after and where they found it. It's your query log. Everyone has one, but not everyone uses theirs. This sample has outbound clicks connected with search terms, which is great because once queries are connected with conversions, customers can help answer questions about search intent. It's also a graph. It's a graph of searchers, queries, and their clicks or other conversions. The queries provide a hint of search intent, the motivation for why this person is searching. The clicks and conversions provide linkage between search intent and a physical resource that, on your site, in your collection, possibly with a level of interest if you collect other signals like dwell time or, or carts or checkouts or anything further down the funnel. Once you have that linkage, it makes it possible to crowdsource some answers to common search questions. So most of this talk is going to be covering some recipes for things you can do with search logs. And I'm going to be switching back and forth with um, some Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, the link is there uh, for Anybody that wants to clone those and, and try this out. Um, so be aware that with any sort of crowdsourcing project, you don't want to just serve raw information from your logs without a filter because query logs are rife with misspellings, inadvertently disclosed personal information, and all sorts of other things you probably don't want people to see. OK, now that we've had the disclaimer, here we go. So this demo data set is a bunch of real estate searches, about 50,000. The fields are user ID, query, timestamp, position, document. Position is useful for search relevance, but we're not going to be using it in any of these demos. In particular, we're going to be working on features. And our first recipe is auto-suggest. So what I like to do when I think about working with query logs is I think about what question would I ask the crowd? What question would I ask all these searchers to answer to help fill out this feature? So with auto-suggest, you've got a query that somebody's typed in and you want to find out, you want to, you want to serve up all the other common ways to frame this question. 
So the way we're going to do that is we're going to take our log and we're going to extract the queries, right? We're just searching queries. That's what auto suggest is. We're going to reshape it down to, we're going to group it by distinct queries. We're going to count the number of unique users who executed that query and click on something. Um, and sometimes it's useful to know how old a query is. In other words, the last time it was in circulation, right? So the last timestamp um, can be useful sometimes. Uh, and then that's going to go in an index, and we're just going to we're just going to run a search against what somebody's typed so far, uh, and we're going to try to incorporate the popularity of that search, right? That's the count and the recency, maybe, um, along with how close of a match what somebody's typed is with what everybody else has typed, um, and that's going to be our, our auto suggest. So here we go. All right. So first thing is to reshape the data, right? So Here's the source data. This is like what I was what I was showing before, and we're going to get distinct queries out of this, and counts. And that timestamp is the last timestamp, right? So, for example, here this this transformation says that 189 people searched for Prudential Real Estate. They ran that query. 189 distinct people, um, because this log has a, a, a new record for every single row, for every single document somebody clicked. Um, even after executing one search, you run one search and you click on five things, you get five records, right? So it's important to be unique by user um, in this case. Uh, so let's make sure that it's I'm using Elasticsearch, so this is how Elasticsearch consumes records. I'm changing it to this um, JSON lines format, and I'm going to load the index. This is the mapping we're using. It's got the count, it's got the last query date, and it's got the query, the field for the query that people are typing, uh, and it's got this uh, search as you type type, which is relatively new in Elasticsearch. It's a convenience feature. Uh, that creates a bunch of n-grammed or shingled fields for you, um, which makes and and some prefix, uh, some fields optimized for prefix searches. Uh, so it's a convenience thing. You can do you can do it before, it's in the last few releases of Elasticsearch. Um, you can do it manually, um, but this is convenient. Let's load the index. All right, that's done. Only fifty thousand records. It's great, actually less because we just compressed it. Um, and now, so we're going to query for suggestions. We'll take a quick look at the query we're going to use. This is a query template, so it's in mustache. And it's trying to match the text of whatever's been typed with um, these different fields that were created by that search as you type field, the subfields. And then we're going to influence the score by multiplying it by that count field, um, uh, which we're going to take the natural log of, so it doesn't so it doesn't blow the score too high up. Um, but this way, uh, things that are queried more frequently will rise to the top. So let me pretend I'm typing here. I'm going to run some queries. All right, P. Let's see. All right, there's some P's. R, Prudential is still a thought. But now I'm E, so I'm going to lose Prudential, and there's Prescott. And some stuff for Prescott, Arizona, Prestige. Then C, should get Prescott. Everything's got Prescott, right? So, so five letters, and I'm already down to a bunch of stuff about one city, um, which is great. And that's what we want out of auto suggest uh, and notice it's also finding things that are in fix right so it's not just it's not just queries that start with Prescott right it's it's uh, they can be at the end it can be in the middle uh, so we want
All right. So that was all I suggest. The second recipe we're going to look at is related queries. So related queries you often see at the bottom of a search engine results page. Um, because by the time you get there and you s scroll down and say, all right, well, these 10 don't help me or however many results you have on that first page, what are some related searches? Um, and uh, these often help people specialize their search. They may help them um, broaden it out to an adjacent area. Um, and the way that we can use query logs to, or one way we can use query logs to help generate related searches um, is to look at other, thinking back like a graph, is to look at other queries that found the documents you found. Right, so I made a, a pretend scenario here because I don't actually have the search engine, I just have the logs. Um, so this is a search for licensing and it returned um, among nicer looking stuff, these 20 links. So these are 20 links about licensing in, a real, in the real estate domain. And they're 20 links from the log I'm working with. So we want to ask the crowd, what are some of the other commonly answered questions by the documents you found? What are the other queries people ran to find and click on the documents that have just come up on your first page of results? All right, that makes sense. So we're finding the other ways in. So we found some things that are relevant to licensing, but we want to know what other topics they're relevant to, because those will be your related searches. So this time we need the query and the documents. Um, and we're going to group it this time by the document. So there's a different index, different shape, different transformation. So we're going to group by distinct documents and then we're going to aggregate, list up all of the queries that found each document in an array, in a list. Um, every query that resulted in a click on that document, right? So we're using that as some proof, as a, as a form of, of crowd proof that that document's relevant to that query, that click, right? Um, and then when we serve it up, I want to display that little widget at the bottom of the search results page. We just want to match all of the documents that came up on that first page. Sometimes you can fetch more if it's if it's helpful, but since you have those already, you can match those ones on the first page. Um, and then just aggregate across queries and see which ones bubble up, right? So here we go. Later queries. All right, so here's a source that source data it looks exactly the same. Right, but this time we want to transform it so that that document column is the the key, right? The prime, the the, the distinct key, um, and those queries. Whenever multiple queries find the same document, we want a list of those. So here goes. All right, so now we've got these document links, and in most cases it's just one query for some of these obscure ones. But here, you have Grand Junction. Couple Grand Junction queries, maybe more than two, that found this 126 realnetsystems.com link. All right, so this is the shape we want. We gotta, we gotta convert that into a form Elasticsearch will like, which looks like this. All right, you got your document links, and you've got your query array. We're going to create an index with this mapping. Real simple mapping. Nothing even is inverted, right? This is just a keyword field for the document and keyword field for the query. Um, so these are only used for exact matching. This is really basically just graph traversal in a search engine. So let's load it. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Done. All right, great. So. Here's the query we're going to use. What we're doing, this is, a, this is a mustache template. This is one of the ways that Elasticsearch um, 
uh, allows you to run queries, right? So by substituting variables. So this is going to take the list of documents that I pass, in this case, those links, um, and substitute them in for this block. It's going to do a terms query with all of those documents. So it's going to find those documents in the index. And then it's going to aggregate the queries that found those documents, right? Super simple. So it's going to reach into those arrays, those lists of queries for each document, and make a single aggregate um, with, with a count for those just to see what bubbles up, right? So here goes. This is the this is the fake query I created, right? The fake results. These are the document links and the results. They're real results from the log. Um, but this is in response to my query for licensing over this real estate data set. All right, so these are the things that um, came back for licensing. We're going to see what other queries caused people to click on these links. That's what this query is going to run. Here goes. Cool. So broker real estate licensing Maryland, California real estate license, connect your real estate license. This this is basically things you know th these different search intents in this log break across state. It's U.S. obviously, but it breaks across states and cities. Um, so there's a lot of cool stuff you could do with um, geolocation, um, but right now this is going to just be scattershot. Um, there's licensing classes, real estate classes doesn't even have the word license in it. So that's cool, right? We get that back. New Jersey real estate courses. So we can get that back as related to licensing because you got to take a course to get licensed, but the word license isn't in there. So that's related queries. It's fun stuff, right? Okay, so the third recipe is synonym candidates. So this is part of the job of a search relevance engineer is have, is keeping track of synonyms within a business domain. Um, this is super important um, for precision. The reason is, um, especially with uh, with concepts in your domain that have more than one word in them. So for example, I live in New York. Uh, when you stand up a search engine for the first time and you index a lot of content that has let's say US states in it, um, anytime somebody types New Mexico, New Jersey, New York, uh, they're gonna get they're gonna get all of those coming back because they all match new, right? Until the, they start working with precision. Um, and there's some cases where you, where you want that, um, but if you've already said New York, search engine should be smart enough to say, hey, New York is a thing. It's a thing that has these two terms. Let's make it one thing instead of two things and not search for the independent parts. Um, uh, real estate's another one of those too, right? So uh, grooming your synonyms is a big part of search engine upkeep and it's useful to have tooling that helps you see, help suggest new synonym candidates. Um, so this is something that a backend relevance engineer or a taxonomist would use um, to, to, uh, to find new synonym candidates. So Take an example again that that work with this concept license. Um, uh, we're going to try to find in the query logs um, what are all the other uh, what are the, all the other uh, like phrases um, that are short phrases or terms that, that that appear around license. This is something that's that you can do a lot better with using NLP tools. But just wanted to illustrate the data um, uh, for this purpose. Um, uh, so we can just do uh, a proof of concept here. Um, so what we need is we need the queries and documents again. So this is the same shape as the last one. It's distinct documents and um, a list of queries that, fa that found that document, that clicked on that document, right? Um, and then we're gonna we're gonna match on the license, right? Like licensing on, on the, the concept that we want to find synonyms for. And then we're gonna and then we're gonna query the different engrams, all the different combinations of adjacent um, terms um, in the index. So here we go. All right. So synonym candidates, same shape, document, and the list of queries. 
Here's our same source data. I'm going to transform it the same way we did last time. Load it. This this index, um, this we're going to use the search as you type again because it's convenient for the engrams um, for those adjacent terms. Um, so that's slightly different. Um, and we're going to load it. Cool, that's done. All right, here's the query we're going to use. This is a multi-match again across all these different ngram fields that were created by the search as you type type. Um, I'm going to say 100% need to match because um, uh, if you are looking for a concept that has multiple terms, um, if you're looking for New York, you want to find thing, you want to find New York City. You don't want to find New Mexico um, as a synonym. Uh, or New York bagels or something. It may not be a synonym, uh, but it's the related terms. Uh, so we're going to run the query, match everything that matches at 100% what you've typed in, in the queries, uh, and then we're going to aggregate up the significant one-term queries, the significant two-term queries, and the significant three-term queries that we found um, in the query log. Um, and we're going to filter out the um, we're going to filter out the, the one that you're looking for. Uh, so let's run this and see what happens. So again, we're, we're looking for license. This one, this one is, is less spectacular. So we're looking for license. We're going to parse out the synonym candidates. Oh, and it blows up. Hold on, let's skip something. Trying to get fancy. There we go. All right. So, so it's trying to get fancy because we get license back, and that's the one. That's the input, and um, you know, you'd strip that out um, before you showed candidates, um, sending them candidates to somebody. But here are some other terms that are related to license. That are that are related to license, right? So conditional requirements. Real estate license, that's a good one, especially in this domain, right? As a thing that, that you might want to make synonymous with license because in this domain, if this was your business, um, that would be synonymous. Licenses, uh, renewal department licensing. Basically, this just gives somebody who's building a controlled vocabulary a lot of fodder for, for constructing that controlled vocabulary so they, can, so they can make sure that when people search for an exam um, that that they that they find the same things that somebody would find for a licensing exam, for example. Um, so there you go. So that's a bunch of different synonym suggestions. You take those and build up um, synonym tables, taxonomies, um, suggestions, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, all right. Recipe four. This is the last one. Um, this is taste profiles. Uh, taste profile is is what your searcher is interested in. This is the the signals that your searcher has provided to let you know about what about their about what they're after and their interests. Um, uh, and one of the things you use taste profiles for is recommendations. Uh, so search logs is a great source of finding taste profiles. Um, So what we're going to do this time, we need the out of the first file, we need the user ID because we're looking for user and the query and the document. Um, and we're, this time we're going to group it by user. So a distinct user and then a list of queries that they've run and a list of documents that they've run. A super simple taste profile. Um, if you have metadata or other things like that on your documents, that's often really useful too because it gives you sort of more coarse grained interests. Um, in this case, just queries and documents. Um, and then once you have a list of these users with their bags of queries and documents, um, then you can look for similar users. Uh, it's a, sort of like a, a collaborative filtering light. Um, you look for similar users, and you try to find uh, things you can recommend um, that other users have found that your user has not yet found. 
or not yet queried, right? So, taste profiles. Okay, same source data. This time we're gonna transform it to keep the user and group by user. And we get a list of queries and a list of documents for each user. Um, so in this case, user 756 search for Chesapeake real estate assessor and Virginia Beach. And at some point they clicked on this Chesapeake uh, city link and at some point some other link, right? So that's what that's what this log tells us. This, this shape tells us. Um, and so we gotta make sure it gets converted into an Elasticsearch happy format. Um, we're gonna create an index. This is the mapping. Uh, so new index for this. Notice I like to make lots of new indexes. Uh, this is index per feature. Often you wanna scale things differently, so it's good to sort of keep things compartmentalized. Um, this is using search as you type again. Um, not sure if it needs to, but we've got the um, we've got the query and the document and the user, right? It's just the same triple. Um, this is the core triples of a query log. And we're gonna load it. Here we go, it's done. All right, so we're gonna take one demo user that I just grabbed off the, close to the top of the list um, and see what that one record looks like for them, right? So this is the taste profile for our user 10,008. Um, they did a bunch of searches for Cape Cod, New Hampshire, Maine, Falmouth. So it's New England real estate searches, right? New Hampshire, different parts of Massachusetts, so somebody's particular realty, um, Marcy Broden ERA. Um, and they clicked on a bunch of these sites, right? So let's ask the crowd, here's our query. That's the crowd who else shares these interests. So this is the more like this query. Um, and we're looking at similarity across the, the field, across the, the, the query and document fields for all these users, right? Who's got the most similar queries and documents for this particular user? Because we wanna look at what they have that this user does not have. Um, here's our user going in for this index as we're looking for, for users that are like this user along the query and document some tuning parameters, and we're gonna get out a bunch of users that are similar, um, and we're going to uh, we're going to aggregate um, their queries and see what bubbles up. We're gonna aggregate their documents and see what bubbles up. But in this case, I'm just gonna um, pull the queries for us to look at, um, just because that's what we've been looking at for everything else. Um, so here's our user, 10,008. And here's some suggested queries. So a lot of them are redundant because there already has been some New Hampshire interest, but it's been specific things in New Hampshire. Um, it's not the exact same thing. Oh, I, I went in here and I um, specifically stripped out all of the queries that this user had already run, everything that was already in the taste profile. So they didn't see anything new. Um, or so they didn't see anything that they've that's redundant, anything that they've done before. So it's all new queries for them. Main real estate, and these are the most common ones, right? So that's why it's broader first, right? And then more narrow, Bath, Maine, Brunswick. Somebody's looking at North Carolina, Oregon, some different outfits, right? Some of these, so it's a little bit across the board. And, and down here, it's starting to be like more one-offs, but like the, the, the big, um, the common ones that bubbled up are these like Maine and New Hampshire um, and, and some of these spots, some of these particular popular places in Maine and New Hampshire. Um, uh, oh, we can do it with documents too, let's see. All right, so here's suggested documents, although this is a little bit unfocused, right? Because we're taking somebody's whole history and saying, oh, look at these documents. If you're gonna do a document recommendation feature, you would probably do it with more of a, um, a condensed time frame and, and, uh, and sort of decay things out over time as somebody lost, lost interest. Um, so that's our recipes and that's the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, the link is there for the notebooks that I just showed you. Now I, and uh, if you have any questions, you can find me either at searchintuition.com or on LinkedIn. Uh, and thank you very much and I hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions.
And thank you, Peter. And uh, Peter joins us now live uh, to answer any questions you have on his presentation. Uh, so I'm just going to have a quick look at the uh, Slack. Oh, can we hear you there, Peter? I can now. Fantastic. Can you hear me? Thank you. Okay, we'll just uh, check the uh, the Slack. Uh, David says Good. nice bikes, um, but we're going to <laughs> move on to some questions first. Um, Zenit asks, would it make sense to add terms that were in the queries but not in the documents and then add them to the documents? This is uh, towards recipe two. Sure, Zenit. I saw a similar question on the uh, Zalando talk from you um, about uh, broadening queries out, um, uh, even misspelled queries, uh, and uh, figuring out how to make that direct connection, right? Um, they were using, uh, you know, a, a neural IR, neural IR approach, which which takes into account like how likely it is that that, that those misspelled queries actually have to do with the with the items that were found, um, you know. And you could certainly do what you're describing, but it becomes more of a of a of a binary solution, right? It either finds it or it doesn't. There's no nuance. Um, mostly for this talk, I just wanted to focus on what kind of information you can get out of the logs. And, and there's certainly a ton of different things you can subsequently do with it, whether it's feeding a manual process or, uh, or an automated process um, or like a semi-automated process. Um, it's a good question. Um, and it, that's the kind of insight that you, that you really do want to get from your users is what is their lexicon that, what is the lexicon mismatch between your users and your, and your collection? Fantastic, thank you. And I know you've partially answered this in the Slack, um, but uh, Tito asked, uh, apart from user, query, timestamp, position, and document, are there any other search transactional log metadata you have found useful to store available? Well, this is one where I'm sure there's a ton that just could be done here, right? Because it's just flipping around and looking at the experience completely from the user's shoes. to look at the collection, right? Um, so it's pretty greenfield. The, the thing that um, I'm particularly interested in is doing um, sort of entity recognition over query logs um, to really start to understand um, what are the domain aligned concepts uh, that exist in there um, and, and how can you use that to help search relevance, right? In terms of query rewriting and everything else, um, you know, or a query segmentation. Um, all right, how do you train a, a classifier to figure out what kind of query this is? Um, but also, uh, you know, in my answer here is uh, just with respect to taste profiling, if, you, if you're able to pull out entities and, and especially controlled domain entities, uh, then you've got a much better signal um, that is domain aligned for what this user is interested in, right? If you want to recommend them content in the future, um, then if you're just working with terms. Fantastic. Um, so that's it for the questions in the channel. I, I perhaps got one for you. Um, so you've done recipes one to four. What, what's the ne give us an idea for the next recipe you could do? Um, sure. I, I think I went. Um, I think I went as far as I could without um, without machine learning, and that was sort of the point of the time. There's probably some other cool stuff you could do here, just sort of exploring that graph. Um, also, the the data set itself is is uh, is really limited. Uh, you know, I'm just trying to find a data set that I could use. Um, uh, but you know, obviously, if you've got the full collection and if you've got full user profile information, you could you could analyze this um, much more deeply into different into you know in terms of sort of like identifying what is this user's persona based on what you know about them and how would you use that. Um, how would you interpret that from their queries, right? Or, or um, you know, or what, you know, what's all the metadata on those documents that is useful in, in sort of like really understanding query intent or like, especially in terms of expanding the context of short, this is something that's come up when the sort of the neural IR tracks a lot, right? Um, is, is that when you're working with, um, you know, embeddings, BERT typically does better with longer queries. And one of the ways that, people overcome this because most queries are short queries, right? Or the, the common ones, um, is that they will expand user queries with additional context from the user's profile, right? Whether it's information about the user or past searches they've run or things like that, right? So so this is another sort of like wide open area to to explore. Um, uh, I, and I, I also really like the um, Zalando idea of just taking, of the sessionization and just taking everything that a user in this case has searched in a day 
um, and uh, everything that they clicked on in a day and just dumping it into a bag and saying, okay, this, how, this is the relative, this is the intent and this is the actual effect of, of this user for today. And if we look at enough users like that, um, you start to see patterns um, and it starts to create queries and items, right? Um, so there's definitely like much, much more that could happen here um, in the, you know, sort of in the, in the NLP and the machine learning vector embedding space. Great, thank you. So there's one more question from Tito here. Uh, when generating related queries and synonym candidates at runtime, do you limit the depth of the documents analyzed for performance reasons? Uh, so this was a toy data set, um, uh, so there was no need to really do that. But the, but there is there is a problem, of course, which is that when you start to get really down the tail of frequency of occurrence of something, like it gets very noisy, right? So there are practical reasons um, at scale to um, to want to look for a certain level of agreement between users on some of these areas, right? So uh, so like something might not truly be a synonym candidate unless unless it shows up frequently, right? Um, so when it, so when I think about depth, I think about I, I think about like how how um, far down the the tail of people's queries do you go before you before you chop it off, right? Um, and especially with auto suggest, that's a that's a big deal, right? That's a big part. Of, I mentioned filtering, right? If you're using raw queries, you get profanity, you get you know depending on what your search engine is, you know, like you get all sorts of content that you don't want to just immediately surface. Um, and a big part of that filtering gets done for you if you just look for consensus. Um, uh, so for like suggestions, like just what are the most commonly other type terms with this term? Um, and you'll get the best, often the best suggestions. Like that said, you still have to filter for the things you don't want in there, but a lot of the noise comes out by just, by just deciding this is the end of, this is where I want to cut the tail, 